Hi everyone, my name is Michael Saluri. I'm a New York based photographer and I'm at B&H Photo here in New York up on 34th Street and 9th Avenue. Um, this afternoon I am going to be uh, sharing with you what I call evidence of space exploration on Earth. It's sort of a riddle and we'll figure that out as we go through the show. Um, as a uh, <clears throat> New York based photographer, I have been here for more than 30 years and I consider myself more of an editorial photographer, but my, my passion is uh, documentary and portrait photography. What I tend to and why I do that kind of work is because I tend to seek out uh, the least obvious when it comes to going on location. And I've been fortunate to travel around the world, South America, India, um, and Europe since Central America. I guess the whole thing really centers around when I said evidence of space exploration on Earth. When you think about, well, space exploration is about space, and isn't it about that? Yeah, because, you always, because that's the end result. That's what you tend to see in television, print media, online. You see the end results of a space mission. I'm concerned with the other 90% that you don't see, which is the people that actually make it possible, the labor force. To me, that's essential evidence because without that, all the pretty pictures and all the things that are out there, we don't get to see. So I'm a big proponent of, um, of documenting that and I've been doing this now for um, uh, more than 12 years. My work is all about light and uh, that probably began uh, here, I was uh, born and raised in Niagara Falls, of all places. Uh, there's not many people that you could probably say that you know from Niagara Falls. Uh, it was a magical place, and it was alive from June until Labor Day. It felt like a Fellini set. Tourists would come in, and it was rather alive. The other nine months was rather dead. So, um, but it still was very powerful, and I think I saw a lot of gray clouds. It probably got me more into the black and white. And um, I think that that idea of looking at things and how they're lit became very, very important to me. So I use that idea of light um, throughout my travels. And I thought before I get into the um, evidence of space exploration, I'd show you the evidence of my documentary work and my portrait work. So this is just a highlight. I'm not gonna go into great depth in any of this, um, and I'll, be happy, I'll just sort of go through this. This is the Ganges uh, in India. This is in Brazil along the uh, Rio San Francisco. This is Bahia. Uh, form and design matter a great deal to me. I don't like literal images. I don't like taking anything that's literal. I tend to hover until I find something that is uh, perceptive, at least to me. This is a mother and son in a remote village in India. Got to, got to uh, travel on a Mississippi River boat that had been disassembled and reassembled uh, in Brazil and spent about a week on this uh, remarkable boat and just simply living off the river. So people, form, shape, design matter a lot to me and often that uh, decisive moment. Cartier-Bresson was a huge influence on my, uh, my street photography and still remains so. Uh, Irving Penn remains another uh, influence in my portrait photography. This is Dwayne Michaels, a fine art photographer. Nigel Holmes is a infographics designer. This is Seymour Cray who was behind the Cray computer which back in the 90s uh, was the fastest machine processor uh, on the planet. Um, it was using um, galenium oxide instead of silicon. Very, very isolated person. I had to go out to um, uh, Colorado Springs to, um, to spend the day with him. This is Charles Blow from the Times. But light means a great deal to me uh, in my portraiture. Sometimes it doesn't take a lot to find the essence uh, behind a person. So a lot of my work requires that I just sort of 
go right into the thing. I need to be very, very front and center, but at the same time be very invisible. Um, this was at a Wizard of Oz conference out in California. And the best thing I could do was just sort of set up a tarp um, in the forest, since we're dealing with Oz characters. But we all know what this is. Remember the hourglass that uh, the witch had turned over for Dorothy and she had so much time before? So um, <clears throat> this uh, belonged to a Hollywood uh, director. And um, he, took it, he took it out of his um, vault for me to photograph. And I thought this might be a good way to transition to um, evidence of space flight. Because as an hourglass is about time, what we are here on Earth is all about being in a, in a galaxy in which we are dealing with vast amounts of distance in vast amounts of time. The Hubble Space Telescope is one of the instruments that has helped us uh, explore the uh, universe. And I got to spend three years behind the scenes with the project that um, essentially had to refurbish the telescope because it was falling apart back from about 2004 to about 2009. The space shuttle made that possible. It was a remarkable, remarkable spacecraft. And um, I have to say now it's been, it's 2011, so it's been seven years this July since uh, its uh, last mission. And certainly many of us uh, miss what that remarkable spacecraft, designed in the 70s, did. And it had its, we lost crew. This comes with the territory. They all signed up for this and they knew that. And um, we miss them, but they, but, but they did, they were heroes in that sense that everyone that gets onto a rocket, believe me, it is not easy. And so any television program, any kind of news that tends to simplify it, do not ever underestimate <clears throat> the fact that uh, it is rocket science and it's a lot of people to make it possible. So my journey began with following the crew training. And what I found was interesting was that um, we live on a water world. And in order to practice to uh, work in space, astronauts need to train in water. And they do so to be able to get a sense of equilibrium, get a sense of what gravity might feel like, although there's gravity here but a sense of balance. So they're weighted and they do their training uh, in this enormous pool called the uh, Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory uh, down in Houston. My fascination with the crew and going into this place was required enormous um, uh, permission from various people to be able to pull off what I did. Lighting in this facility had never been done in this level before. My work is all about shooting sim sim simply. And, uh, and that means one light and not a lot of complexity. Um, I tend to be a one lens, two at most, maybe three lens kind of photographer, and I do not shoot by the numbers. I do not know what that means. I don't. Now, even though I've taught at RIT in Rochester for five years, and I've been in this profession for 40, my work is all about one camera, in the days it was film, and one lens, maybe two. So this was the, um, I wanted to add a little bit more dimension and drama to the crew uh, in their training uh, at the MBL. And these images reflect this kind of uh, process. And it made me feel that like it was really about training for space on Earth, and that's sort of planted the seed for me about evidence of space flight or space exploration on Earth. This is not easy work. These suits are very heavy. And while they seem relatively light, lightweight in space, they need to train in water with replicas of the exact type of space suits they, uh, they're going to be working with. But for the, but the amount of I'm just say craftsmanship, demonstrated by so much of the support crew, is what fascinated me because <clears throat> the burden was on, on the astronaut training, but behind them were, were an infinite amount of people 
to make sure they knew their A through Zs. And it took training over and over and over again. In the case for Hubble, they were training for two years in order to fix and repair the telescope. So this is essentially a very small remote NICOR 800 uh, flash with a sensor because I'm around water and I'm not going to be bringing strobe units and I'm not going to be bringing complexity. Again, it's just with all due respect to all the complexity that's probably sold here, you know, I tend to work simply. You know, that's, that's what it's all about. And there you could see the light. I mean, it wasn't a big deal, but what I was after was that. I could achieve something very dramatically and it didn't, and it, and, and it works. Catch these moments. The, the off moments also appeal to me, and this is again part of this evidence of, um, of space exploration. And the human touch behind this, because it is about people. There's nothing mechanical about this at all. <clears throat> the labor force on the shuttle, um, I love being around uh, these, these men and women. They knew their stuff. They knew exactly, they look, may, may appear to be very laid back, be happy to go out for a beer at six o'clock, but when it came to being around a spacecraft, they knew that A to Z. And they could deal with any engineer, regardless of the degree, and talk about exactly that latch, talk about this and about that. They knew their stuff. Everything down at the Kennedy Space Center having to do with space is about scale. Everything is much larger than you think it is. It is enormous, and it is industrial. It is industrial. There's, it's, it's not Star Trek. The bridge isn't polished. The lights, it, this is, it, it's very, very industrial. Getting around this, because it's a secure area, takes um, passes, it takes badges, and typically these had to be issued um, to me. The numbers on the, on the left here basically is a code so that when I'm with an escort, or typically it'd be an engineer working in a particular area that I was with, followed these, this list. And these are the areas that I needed to have access to during my documentation. And those numbers then uh, corresponded to this. So I talked about scale. So that gives you a sense of just what the space shuttle looked like as it's being moved out to its launch pad. That's me on the far left if you can see it, shooting up. The rocket was enormous. And if you think that was enormous, wait till you see the rocket system, the SLS that's being um, currently um, uh, built and first flight scheduled for early 2020. This is an enormous rocket on the scale of, a, of Saturn. <clears throat> so there's the, um, these, the, and the two large um, devices on either side of the shuttle are the umbilicals. It's what feeds the fuel and all the electrical information up until um, the final seconds of countdown. And that's the photograph that I made from that position. Scale, again, was everything. <clears throat> it's almost processional. Technicians will go out on this enormous baseball-sized field tractor as they take the shuttle out to its launch pad. And, um, and just the sound, you just you smell diesel, there's water being sprayed up ahead, and it's going at about two miles an hour. So it'll take, it'll take about five hours to go the three miles from that building to, to the launch pad. Here's some examples of some of the people, again, reinforcing the idea of evidence of, 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 of making space exploration possible on Earth. Um, <clears throat> This particular technician is actually in front of one of the three engines of the space shuttle, but with, uh, as it's in its dry dock, essentially being ready for flight. This is the engine compartment of the space shuttle. That was just an amazing experience to go in there. <clears throat> and I, I, I felt that it was like going into a fine jeweled watch. Why? Because the craftsmanship was extraordinary. Everything worked. You have to appreciate that. And some of this technology goes back to the, went back to the 70s. Everything in that plumbing worked. I mean, just think about it. Fires up to 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. The sound and decibel level would kill any of us instantly. The machine worked. So this was one of, uh, this is Jim Delight. He um, had been a uh, jet aircraft maintenance guy out at Orlando Airport. 
and then went to study, and now he's, uh, this is within the engine compartment. That is the main fuel lead coming in from the fuel tank that spreads out to the three engines, just to give you a sense of scale. <clears throat> Again, when I would look at, at spacecraft, I would try to look at its beauty and try to discover something in its abstractions or its design. Um, in this case, um, yeah, I just forgot his name. Sorry. Uh, was working on putting the glue in between each one of those tiles protected the infrastructure of the vehicle. And uh, he essentially was putting glue and those lights over there so it made sure they were dry. Security was always tight down there, and, uh, but this gives you an idea of really what it is. The launch area, just to keep in mind, was built in 1963 for the Apollo era, when Kennedy gave the, we will go to the moon. And so this is uh, how old that infrastructure is. Ravi, portrait is a thermo, uh, thermodynamic engineer uh, at the launch pad. These are some of the, uh, the maintenance guys that actually work around the tractor to make sure when they assemble and put the launch pad down on its posts. Being with the crew was another experience and I sought details that would humanize them as opposed to looking at any kind of media feed for eight or nine seconds and say, oh, it's just another astronaut. No, they could be your brother, your sister, your cousin, your father or your mother. And I would try to look for elements and Scooter was the commander of this and uh, that was his coffee mug that he took around with him. In following him, uh, this is out of Ellington Air Force Base, in which the um, flying crew train on T-38 aircraft. This is all part of their preparation for flying. They had to keep hours. And that was um, a shooting session. And then that was the result. Photographing the crew uh, required a lot of patience and time. I knew what I wanted and it just took a lot of time to be able to negotiate it. And to be able to light and get something that's very different so that we get this kind of image was almost seven months in the making. Seven months in the making. So my solution was that I was shooting for um, Discover Magazine at the time. This is about 2007. And um, to do the portrait, there hadn't been a portrait of a crew since before Challenger, so it was almost 20 years. And why the why I was told, well, could you make the picture in 20 minutes? I said, no, I'll need three hours. And that was just to make the photographs. But I needed seven hours to set up the lighting. So it became quite an ordeal. The location I wanted was a big deal. I wanted something very unique, and eventually, what I found was this. You're gonna say, well, what is this? Is this like a, you go into a sound, like here, you go into a sound room and there's that gray foam. If you know that gray foam that you see? So this is the anechoic laboratory at the Johnson Space Center. This is a three-story building. It's tough to kind of show the scale here. Um, but this room is used to work out and test out the radio frequencies for spacecraft. And they need to have absolutely dead interference. It can't be outside radio. Uh, cell phones, anything like that. So this space is isolated. So it's extremely quiet. What appealed to me <clears throat> was the quality of gray in the cones and the height. And I felt that with the right lighting, this could offer a very, very interesting background for a portrait. So these were um, uh, the people who actually ran the laboratory. And I asked them to come out and just come into what I thought would be a pose. This is all natural light. Um, and it took seven months to come to the point where we started lighting for this thing. And so uh, it's my assistant, John. And uh, typically on location, you plan for everything. You plan for everything. You take nothing for granted. But there's always surprises, particularly in this case, the engineer in there said, well, said, well we can give you that boom. We'll move it for you if you want to change the height of your light. I said, sure. <clears throat> so there's a lot of improvisation that can't be anticipated until you often you get there. So you play into serendipity. And so John is adjusting the light. Um, I um, enjoy working with Shamira lighting, and I had a very, very definite look that I wanted to achieve with the portraiture. And that was the beginning of what I wanted to, to shoot. I wanted the light coming from the top, 
and that background to be very subtle and give a lot of texture. Is that coming across okay? I don't know how the lighting, we good on the lighting? Yeah, okay. Um, so these are, I shot both black and white film and I shot Cohen negative because I actually didn't know what was gonna work best. So I sh had two backs, I shot with a Hasselblad H2 and one lens, it was an 80 millimeter lens, that was it. Why? Because if you look back to, I think some of the great portraiture, whether it was August Sander shooting in Germany back in the 30s or Irving Penn, Richard Avedon, one lens. And this gave me a lot more control to work with each of them. So I photographed each of the crew individually so they can get used to me and I can get used to them and realizing that we're getting something very, very different. Mike Massimino, who you may see, he lives here in New York. I think he's up at Columbia now. Uh, Megan. And then that was the final crew shot. And I left the lighting in because I liked actually the element of showing really what I was working with. So we, you're looking at basically um, the two main, these are pancake lights coming down with the lighting on that. This gave me an even light. My f-stop was constant all the way through. I learned that actually studying Stanley Kubrick because on a Kubrick set, Kubrick would light so that no matter where he placed his camera, the f-stop was the same. F8 here, F8 there, F8 there, it was all the same. That way you didn't have to do a lot of setup. You can just go anywhere and shoot and work with his actors. <clears throat> this um, was remarkable. This actually is the camera system that was install installed into the Hubble during the, uh, the mission. This was it about a year before the flight. I saw it as a piece of sculpture. I asked all the engineers involved, can I photograph this thing as sculpture? And they sort of looked at me um, and I said, one light, they said, let us think about it. They got back to me in two hours. They said, well, come back at five o'clock. That's what happened. So they rotated this on a, on a table and it maybe took 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes. But, but being able to work with hardware, I mean, this thing is a quarter of it, this was $250 million piece of equipment. $250 million, you know. So it was, uh, but to me it was beautiful. And it also showed the intricacy of what can be built, built and designed and implemented for space. This is one of um, uh, um, the, the managers for Hubble. Um, Seppi uh, is a legend at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center and very much behind all the servicing missions for Hubble. Looking for ephemera on, on chalkboards, on tables, become part of that documentation and part of that evidence of spaceflight. The tools <clears throat> were a big deal. These were not off the shelf. They didn't go into um, Home Depot or Sears, not that it's around. Uh, these were essentially being designed for use in space. They had to be designed in space with glove. Astronauts are using a pressurized glove. And so all the corners had to be rounded and they had to be specifically designed for a particular ca um, task. This is, this is actually a replacement computer system for the Hubble um, that was in storage and was gonna be brought up to the Hubble because uh, the one that was up there had failed. And um, this one was taken apart, built, taken apart again, examined, tested, and now this is ready now for flight. But the crew training, what you always tell the crew are wearing one of the white gloves they use for um, EVA, for the spacewalks. And that's what led me to fascination with the tools. And could I, and I wanted to photograph the tools as pieces of sculpture. So this involved going into a clean room, having all the equipment cleaned, and knowing exactly how I was gonna shoot it in the amount of time that I was given. So they, NASA, uh, the, the, the good folks down at Goddard allowed me to set up uh, an impromptu studio and uh, essentially a table with um, acrylic, sort of an opaque acrylic, about uh, 3 8 inch thick, supported by two crates that were there. And, um, and one light that I had underneath. 
and reflectors. That's what I worked with. And, um, and that was it. I had to be in the bunny suit, um, no food, no water, um, but everything had to be specifically laid out, and that's how I operated. So the result of this was this. I shot in black and white film, a film called TechPan. It does not exist anymore. Kodak stopped selling it around 2005. I bought as much as I can. It's in my icebox, and I take it out for very, very special occasions. The film tends to aim more towards the infrared. And this is something that digital will not do ever, is do what a black and white film, a good black and white film can do. And I think I have 10 rolls left. But these are some of the tools <clears throat> that the crew used in space. These were either shot before they went in space or when they came back. But all of them have been, up in sp uh, have been out in space. The, um, the um, power grip tool is something you've probably all seen. This was one of the first tools designed back in the 80s. They can adjust the torque. The, the battery is down at the bottom, and they can adjust uh, this by putting different, um, what do you call the tools? Screwdriver, Phillips, you know, whatever. Bits, very bits in, yes, thank you. So wax gun, the Hubble's latch doors need to be waxed and, and lubricated, so they would put this device and they would put lubrication suitable for being in space where it is either plus 250 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a foot constraint. Astronauts slip their boots into this to be able to hold their position when they're in space. This is a cutting tool. So just, you know, just various tools that were used. This was designed to extract um, computer cards out of the computer system in the Hubble. It was never designed to do this, but yet they designed this to go in there because one of the cards had fried and one of the instruments were useless. And so they designed this tool to go in and pull out the old card and then insert a new one. And this is the way it looks just before flight. There's inventory control, and it's all good old writing on pencil and paper. Here's the last test. Here's what it is. And I left the tape because that tape is ubiquitous uh, on space flight, whether it's here, Russia, China, anywhere in the world, this, this, this kind of tape. Being with the crew, another form of evidence, um, I got to fly in the simulators with them. And um, uh, the commander is always at the left seat, and the co-pilot but the pilot in this case on the right. Um, Scott Altman was on the left, and, uh, and Greg Johnson was on the right. So this is a full mock-up of the space shuttle, and uh, at this point, uh, we were, I was essentially in, you know, in the seat. I could move this way and that way, and essentially we were coming in, and we were doing a deorbit and landing. And that was Megan. Uh, I mean, the light was like, this film was pushed to 6,400, just to give you an idea how low the light was. But it was remarkable, because they were in their moment, and I was in my moment. When they're training and other forms of simulation, they, they suit up in their, um, their suits. Sir, can you stop the light, please? That's sort of like getting in the way. Sorry. Yep, thanks. And working with them, I mean, what was remarkable is that there was an enormous amount of, tr of trust, and I felt like I was part of them. And so I could be in there with them as they were going through their moments, finding uh, what it was like. And here they're preparing for as if they were in space, preparing to deorbit. There's guidebooks that follows them. And there are moments where it's exhausting. It is, it is exhausting. These, these men and women were absolutely spent by the end of the day. But here they're practicing for the, um, for a, it's, it's another simulator and they're practicing for the landing. And then in context, that was the room. So it looked like, it's like a benign room, but, but, but that's, where, that's where the training is. When I met the crew and asked to, um, that I could continue working with them, let's set it off. I asked them what the quality of light is like in space. I don't know what that is like. And it had fascinated me ever since John Glenn's first trip into space, 1962. This is actually the first sunset photographed in space by John Glenn. Um, he had a very simple ANSCO camera, 35 millimeter, that the technicians had, had um, uh, rigged for him. 
and he shot on basic color negative film, maybe ASA 100, I don't know, something like that. And he shot through the, the window, the very small window of the Mercury um, spacecraft. But this is the first uh, sunrise ever photographed in space in 1962. The crew asked me to work with them on how to make better pictures in space. Technically, I said, I'm not your guy, because they have three or four people, and they have as much equipment as B&H does in terms of complexity and lenses and stuff like that, they were more interested in how to use their eye and take, take use of the fact that they're gonna be up there for 12, 13 days. How do, you, how do you acclimate? How do you actually slow down enough to actually let in the fact I'm in space, right? So that's what I worked with them over a period of two years. We met a number of times and I started by showing them pictures of what their earlier colleagues did back in the Apollo era. The spacecraft back then were much, much smaller than, than what the shuttle was. They used bigger cameras, Hasselblad. They shot film, and they brought light meters. So I wanted to simplify the whole thing, because by this time, this is 19, 2008, 2009, I mean, the photographs the crews were coming back with looked like uh, what I would call photo booth photography. It was uninspirational. It was um, shot with a flash, and it, it didn't look like it was in space. And so it was basically the kind of stuff you shoot now with an iPhone, a little flash, make a little grab shot, and you say, oh, okay. And that's what was being done. This crew wanted to do something very, very different than that. So I had them look, this was some of the pictures they made, of looking at found moments that they found. The idea that they had something that, why they take for granted, that they can, in fact, memorialize, photograph it, and they have something then to look at and share with their families about what life in space is like. So here you see the Velcro because everything floats in space, you have to have Velcro. So this is an orange drink that um, one of them was, uh, had just finished. Shooting in the available light is very tough because a lot of the cameras um, are limited in their exposure setups, uh, but now they're shooting this through the various windows in the shuttle, um, but they're able to come up with this kind of um, feeling like you're really in space. And then um, with John Grunsfeld in particular, who was an avid photographer, um, I said to them, I said, you know, the Hubble has got a reflective surface. Why don't we start thinking about making self-portraits? And that was the beginning. And I'll show you how that ended up. And that the crew, and here's just another picture that the crew had made, and um, really impressive um, in finding these wonderful moments where light, shape, and design all come, in, come to play. Um, hanging out with the crew, I got to do some crazy stuff. Um, I had a, um, an art book with um, really good paper and chalk. And um, as the final months before lunch came in, I asked them to write their name, say what they were doing, and, and date it. And uh, as a means of, of, again, creating this evidence that they knew they were about to do something important. But it's something now for everyone else to realize that they're going into space. Um, they were fun to work with. Um, John often would take my camera and photograph me, and I would photograph him. That's how that would work. I, I will say, I have a little bragging rights here. Uh, Megan was in charge of the, um, of the remote arm on the shuttle, and I spent an afternoon with her in training, and then she taught me how to actually grapple the Hubble, and I got it on the third try. First two times, I destroyed it. That wasn't very good, but this was um, two hands to be able to work this. And um, it's just, it was remarkable, and very memorable. Um, another occasion was that <clears throat> um, we have to wear the bunny suits, everybody has to wear the, the cloths because of keeping the amount of dust uh, levels down. And we're in a room where the, 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 the quality of air is, is uh, exponentially greater than any operating theater in a medical facility. It doesn't even come close. It's, it is so pure because things in space have to go up clean. And I mean that in the strictest sense of the word. But I wanted to play with them. So I brought in one of the pictures of the portraits I had made about a year, a year earlier. And I said, well, let's do chorus line. And we ended up with this. <clears throat> Believe me, heads turned. It was, but then, Adding lighting, we saw these kinds of things where people working, a lot of documentation, this sense of reverence and care for the equipment they're using, um, tools, again, working with the simple lighting in, a, in an enormously difficult lighting 
lighting conditions. Following the shuttle, over many years, um, we have to be inside the what they call the vertical assembly building, and uh, there was a point where the vehicle would be rolling out and would pass these two floodlights you see on either side. It would last about two minutes, and that's what I lived for. This is three in the morning to wait for just to get that shot. Um, again, one camera and a 70 to 200 millimeter lens. That was it, and a tripod, coffee. That's the way it looks on the pad. Again, the labor force fascinated me, and to them, this was just a day at the garage. This was the garage. I'm not a NASA photographer. I do not work for NASA. I have had the privilege to be within NASA's culture and photograph them at work. So this guy needs to stand corrected. All right. This is training, and the event there's um, Issues uh, during the uh, launch sequence, the crew need to leave the launch pad. They're being drilled on how to get into these particular buckets uh, to safety. But in the weeks prior to launch, um, the minutes are ticking, and Charlie Blackwell Thomas here is essentially reading the crew the essentials. This is in the white room. This is this little white area that attaches to the hatch. And you can just look at the expressions to see basically the, the gravity of the situation and the import that they are getting ready for launch. In a rare occasion, two space shuttles on, on the launch pad. This happened, I think, four times in the entire 30-year history of the, of the shuttle. This was the case because uh, in order for Hubble to work, there had to be a bank backup shuttle in the event that Atlantis fell into disrepair or there was some significant issue and they could not get back, the Endeavor back there would fly up and, and do a rescue and be able to launch within 48 hours. <clears throat> Being with the crew required um, a um, medical checkup and a lot of paperwork to have the paperwork to be with them because in the last 14 days, I think before launch, 10 days, they're in quarantine, and for those around them, have to be also in quarantine. Um, that's what it looks like being in one of those things. This is actually the shuttle launch pad, and um, uh, Ed and Mark have just come having the final sign off before they close the, um, the cargo bay doors. On the day of launch, um, the crew was able to arrange with the head of the astronaut office to, uh, for me to be there with them four hours before launch. This is a privilege that is rarely, rarely, rarely granted. And so my, my, this is the same room that Neil Armstrong, all the Apollo guys, this is the same room. And so I just sort of looked at the opportunity. I shot in black and white largely, one lens, and simply did these photographs of uh, a station for each of the seven crew. So the inspiration for a lot of this, and something I waited 30 years to do, was based on something I saw when Alan Shepard, who was the first American astronaut to go into space in 1961. And I found this photograph of his boots, gloves, and helmet. And, um, and I love the photograph. I don't know who the photographer was, but uh, he's in his Mercury capsule and he is ready to be sealed in. This was in May of 61. But, I, I, but the fact that that moment could be there, it wasn't a mug shot, it wasn't a scripted shot, it was unscripted kind of difficult to communicate unscripted in an era where everybody's using a selfie and saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. Not the case with space, just, just to put it out there. So that's what it looks like. That's how serious it looks. Megan, they're, they're roughly four hours from launch, and it is a very quiet moment. Scooter's the commander, and he's ready to go. He is so ready to go. And bueno, Mike, Drew Fustel was a rookie. As we speak, Drew is now commander of the space station. He's now currently in orbit around the Earth. Uh, this is his, um, this would be his third mission uh, in space. And he left Earth uh, from Russia uh, end of March, and he'll be up there through the end of August, early September. What was fascinating about Drew is he grew up in Detroit and his dad was an automotive engineer mechanic at General Motors. 
So all these guys have something working with their hands. Besides the PhDs, all the academics, there is something pretty grassroots about them. John Grunsfeld uh, is an astrophysicist, Chicago, and John was Mr. Hubble. He, he, knew that, he knew that telescope inside and out. And this was his third mission to the Hubble and a fifth mission to space. The shuttle is a remarkable, was a remarkable um, uh, flying machine. Dale launched, this is a scooter out at the launch pad, looking up at the shuttle. When they go up the elevator, they go in, down this, um, this yellow brick road, if you will, through those doors and get into this room where they go through and each of them are placed into their seats on the shuttle. Again, the tools that are used by the um, closeout crew. This is often led by uh, Rene Ahrens, who, uh, uh, another remarkable person, whose skill level, the, it was almost a, a small culture of being able to, to, on the day of launch, with astronauts going into space that began back in the 60s. And a lot of that early group were people that came over with Wunder von Braun from, from Germany, and it, was, it became this thing of how to prepare humans for space, put them in, and everything was exacting. It was just, just remarkable, just, just remarkable. That's the way it looks, that, to that hatch, and the next stop is space. Hatch is closed. This was um, a film shot done with an Ilford film that actually um, was an SX200 that tends to go towards the infrared. So it was one of the few times that I actually said, I'll get a filter, red, and play with this to bring out the white. And, I, and the day was great in order to do that. Again, in the launch control room, you've got books that govern the launch. And this is just one of the three rows of the computer systems that actually control the entire launch operation, down to decimal zero, 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 zero. That's the preciseness. Mike Linebeck was the shuttle launch director. He had the final word on go or no go. And I did the portrait of him uh, three months before the end of the, um, of the shuttle program. Atlantis was gonna be the last uh, spacecraft to fly of the shuttle, of the shuttle um, trio and it was also the uh, spacecraft used for Hubble. On the day of launch, uh, kind of like what it looked like, um, lens, car, you know. Uh, I'm on top of the vertical assembly building, and this is two of the three people that had to be with me. Um, I had, a, um, I believe I had a 500 millimeter lens to get that picture. Now. I said I was going to talk about rocket launches. Should any of you ever have the chance? You'll not be able to go to the vertical assembly building, and you will not be able to get within three miles. That will never happen unless you are certified media or have a good reason to be there. So typically, you'll be at a place six miles, and you can go to the, the um, Kennedy Space Center uh, Visitor Center and buy tickets, and you'll be within six miles, which is still powerful enough to, to hear and to see. Uh, your lens would probably then be around 600 millimeter, 700 millimeter, and uh, the basic story is a, a thousandth of a second at, and three stops under. That's the way it works. Why three stops under? The amount of light that comes from one of these things. If you don't do it, it will be overexposed and look like a picture you might make of looking at an eclipse without the glasses. Just putting that out there. Uh, I had another remote camera set up 90 degrees to where I was. It was all remote. And uh, although why I shot color, I think it was on a, I um, converted to black and white. I used Silver FX Pro for that. And um, I think it came a, little more, a lot more dramatic. These are among the shots the crew had made in orbit. Um, this is Hubble Mission Control. There's Hubble. And their scooter now, they've grappled the telescope, and Megan is now going from where I was with her in the dome, and now getting ready to actually work the robotics and begin work servicing. And there's the books. There wasn't anything on the computer screen where they could Google. They brought up books. Books were good. Books was information. And then the crew did this. One of them did this. It was, was kind of cool, actually, of leaving the air hatch 
and going out into space. So you see the blue back there? That's, re that's actually reflection coming off the Earth. That's Earth light, that blue. And then there was a shot that we saw as they were leaving. Um, so there's more evidence of teamwork, legacy, and this is just some of the shots that the crew had made um, through the window. Um, extraordinary work, I think, in capturing that sense of what it's like to, to work in space. The results of all this ended up in a book, which you guys may have seen or not seen, called Infinite Worlds. Simon & Schuster published this several years back, and it is still available uh, on Amazon. Preparing for something like a book, to go into another aspect of photography, is all about workflow. And I take that very, very seriously, um, and I still feel I'm on a learning curve on this. But to do it, I needed to have the right tools. And that, for me to be able to give Simon & Schuster a level of, of finished files to get a book that would be superbly printed, I needed to have uh, a top of the grade monitor. And so I work with ESO, and I work with ESO only. And uh, you want to Google them, I'm working with a 27-inch uh, monitor that automatically calibrates its color balance. I need it to be flawless. So the things I work with tend to be, from an engineering point of view, flawless. When I'm in places where I'm re in restricted areas, when I am working with in, in locations where people have trusted me to go into their work worlds, nothing on my part can fail. And it doesn't mean pulling out the cell phone and saying, oh, I'll cover myself with the cell phone. It doesn't work that way. You know why? Cell phones are turned over. You don't go into restricted areas with cell phones, along with your car keys and everything else. That, that's how serious it is. So working with the ESO has been a very, very important part of my workflow. Creating, a book, creating that book took three years, and a lot of it took creating four by five cards and writing out the idea of how I would tell the story, kind of like outlining a, an essay. And then there were a lot of proofs. Mag pictures would come back in, and we'd have to, to, um, to look at them. Printing finished work, and I've got examples here, is another aspect of my work. Um, Canon has been extremely good to me, and I work exclusively on their printers, and I work with Moab paper. This is made by, uh, by Legion. And I work with these papers now since 2010. The reason I work with MOA paper is because of uh, it's expensive, yes, but that actually means little when it compared to the quality of the fiber content and the quality of the way the paper is made. The paper is made consistently. And expensive, yes, but I want, I need that because my work ends up on, in museums and in galleries. This print, for example, is being made um, for the Smithsonian's uh, National Air and Space Museum for a show. And then the work uh, became part of the permanent collection. This was um, 40 by 30 inches, I think. And then here's an example of working off the, the Canon printers with um, about 24 by 30 prints. I work on a small level with um, uh, Canon's uh, Pro 1000, a remarkable machine. The platen has vacuum on it, so the paper now is actually sucked evenly all the way across. And when you come up here afterwards, I just ask that you not touch the pictures, but you can see examples on the Moab paper, both the uh, Entrada that I work with and with Juniper over there, uh, and how that, and how that uh, machine particularly prints. This is an example of an exhibition um, at the Kennedy Space Center that is now also part of their permanent collection And again, the, the finished pictures, um, these were Framers um, Nightworks over in Jersey City. Been doing it since the 70s. And it was a real thrill to see my work, you know, museum quality ready for, for framing. And then the end result was this at the Kennedy Space Center. At the Visitor Center, you can see the, the two pictures over there. So, um, Time and distance, that's really what space is all about. I mean, in some respects, you're out there, you look at the stars, you're seeing really a time machine because every time you look at a star, you're really looking at something from yesterday. That starlight left five, 10, 15, 100,000 millions of years ago. It's yesterday's light. 
And so we observed that from Blue Dot Earth. <coughs> and um, another mission that, had, that I really wanted to be a part of was the quest to send a space probe to the Pluto system. Pluto was the only unexplored planet. And by early 2000, uh, the Voyager spacecraft had essentially made reconnaissance of every planet in our solar system, not just Voyager, but other ones. But the only remaining was Pluto. What is Pluto? What was Pluto? What did it look like? What was it made of? Was it going to be an ice ball? Was it going to be rocky? What, what was it? Was it a comet? So um, I began a 10-year, 12-year being in bed with the crew. Alan Stern was a principal investigator on that. And I became part of that group um, nearly, at nearly every major milestone to simply photograph that change in both uh, before mission and with the people afterwards. So that was the spacecraft. And that's really how big it was. This thing was only 1,000 pounds, about as big as a piano. To photograph the instruments that are inside the spacecraft required that a, a lot of planning because I wanted to photograph the mirror system of the cameras. So I would typically draw out how I was going to photograph it. I work with Cineo lighting. Um, it's an LED-based lighting. I'm not going to bring tungsten light in here. And Cineo, um, again, remarkable engineering and craftsmanship. You're looking at a lighting system that's about as wide as this, weighs maybe a couple pounds. But this, with barn doors to shade the light, a rheostat to control the light, gave me everything I did and the options to photograph the object. So I had this set. And then the results ended up like this. So there was the Cineo. And um, I like backlighting a lot. And then the idea then, um, he's cleaning, actually, the mirror. This is part of the 8-inch mirror system of the Lori camera. Um, and that's, that's what, that was the photograph. That's, I went from that. That's really what I photographed was that. And here are just some others. Of, this was the titanium infrastructure for the camera. I'm shooting with uh, Canon on this case. This was the uh, Canon 5D Mark II. And I like the whole idea of the shadows reflector as being a part of the picture like I did with the crew portrait. This was actually the um, carbon-based shell that encompassed the camera because when the little door on the spacecraft opened, it was 250 degrees below zero. So everything had to operate. This was the secondary mirror on the system. First time I ever used an iPhone light. One of my influences on, on portraiture a lot was Irving Penn. Uh, this actually was his setup in his studio. And I admired the way he photographed and the graphic approach and compositional approaches that he used. So this influenced the way I would photograph. These were some of the engineers working on the New Horizons mission. Again, this is black and white film. And yes, it was the tech pan. So, uh, this is about two months before launch. And these are the final engineers with the spacecraft. This was the spin test. All aircraft, I'm sorry, aircraft, spacecraft are sent revolving in order to be able to, for balancing. Because once you're in space, it's like a, it's like a bullet. The bullet has to be going around, be on a straight path, and not wobble. Um, this photograph was run on the front page of the New York Times uh, several days after the launch to discuss the journey of New Horizons that basically politically may not actually was not going to make it. And uh, Ed, um, Kenneth Chang actually told a very, wrote a very good story about that. On the day of launch, I felt that this probe was going into the unknown and leaving a water world, so I wanted to document it as a sense of being by water. And then I used a remote camera to photograph the launch of, uh, of New Horizons to Pluto. There are various, I'm not going to show a lot of stuff, but these are various portraits I made of some of the uh, key planetary scientists. And again, using the idea that I used with the um, uh, Hubble crew, I had them write down what they, what they were thinking. This is 2012, so this was three years before the encounter, what their thoughts were at that time and what, what they thought maybe they would discover when the New Horizons hit Pluto. This is Jeff Moore is a planetary geologist. Fran. 
Again, badges and accreditation were very important to get into, um, into this. The facility we were using was um, the Applied Physics Lab, and um, the security there was as rigorous or more rigorous than actually on a, on a NASA installation. But these are the kind of pictures I was looking to make of finding people working on this as they were going into a history they had no idea what was going to unfold. In the mission control room, all the data was being fed from the deep uh, space network. There's three huge satellite, I mean, um, uh, antennas that are about different parts of the Earth, Spain, um, Spain, Australia, and I think in the West Coast. Goldstone. The Goldstone, yeah. And so the data would relay there. And it took four and a half hours for the signal to go one way. That's, so um, uh, Alice was the uh, control person. Alice ran the lab. And uh, um, a Trekkie at heart. Everybody loves Star Trek. And, uh, and, a, and a great musician to, to boot, by the way. Place, I think, man mandolin, I think she said, yeah. And this is the way, in the final days before the encounter, this is just some of the office spaces that I got to walk around and capture what it was like being prepared for the unknown. Um, Mark was in charge of the final um, trajectories and uh, trajectory, the engineering and making sure everything was going to be operating uh, correctly, particularly the overseeing the, the mathematics that were going to be involved to make sure that the probe was going to fly by because everything had to be pre-programmed. It was all autonomous. Uh, Yang Ping uh, actually designed the, uh, the trajectory, and she did it on pencil in that book. And then it had to computer, but um, just, just remarkable. She's also designing the, uh, designed the trajectory for the Parker Solar Probe that goes up uh, in end of July. It'll be orbiting up to 4 million miles above the sun. There we go, the rocket science some of you might be looking for. This is Chris, who's in charge of the instrumentation on board. What I'm using here is the Sineo lighting. Is, again, again, I'm working with just that one light source, often with an egg crate, which kind of diffuses the light, or barn doors, to, and I just simply use it as on that, let all the rest of the light fall back naturally. Working. Um, there was a big conference room everybody met day by day, and there were a lot of wow moments. This is the equipment I, I used, keeping to the one camera, two lens philosophy. Uh, there's my light meter, and uh, the computer. What I don't have in the picture are the glyph drives. I work with glyph hard drives exclusively. I wouldn't think of working with anything else other than a glyph. Um, I like the fact not only that they're made essentially here in the US, up in Cortland. But the reliability that I discovered doing the Hubble mission was remarkable. Because if I'm, if I'm downloading 20, 30, 40 you know, gigs of information a day, I want that hard drive as a backup to be there. I don't want any doubt. I don't want any doubt. So I do not work with consumer level equipment. I just, I just don't. So Glyph is just something that I, uh, I admire and the reliability that it's always going to be there. And they're small. They're very transportable. On the case of this, I work with an 85 millimeter f1.2 and a, um, I think it was a 20, a 20 to 35 millimeter zoom. Those are the two lenses I worked with. Anybody know who that is? That's Brian May from Queen, you know the group Queen. So Brian is actually a PhD astrophysicist, besides being the lead guitarist for Queen, and he came to visit us during the. Um, Launched, and it was, it was nice having him there. Um, another photographer who was a planetary scientist made pictures of me working, so I thought I'd show you what some of that looked like. Um, and a lot of it was just, I mean, people knew me. I mean, I was the fly on the wall. People did not think twice that Michael was there. I was just blending in. And so I would look, and I would just sort of let the story come to me. I wouldn't force anything. This was all unscripted. So, and get images like this, or this is going on, and I just, I, I lean against the blackboard and I wait there. And then I, something like that. Or looking for moments like this. 
on the day of the flyby, it was absolutely magical. It was 6.15 in the morning, and everybody hadn't really slept because we, we didn't know what we were going to see. We were waiting for that first picture to come from Pluto. Um, and it did, and there was that awe. And that was the picture um, that sort of became the best of that particular morning of uh, looking at, at, the, at the first image of Pluto. Eight hours later, we needed the confirmation that the probe actually had photographed everything. The drives had been full. And so um, there were just three of us in there, the, the applied APL's house photographer, um, Bill Ingalls, who's a NASA photographer, and myself had the privilege of actually being in the room during all of this. So this is the way it looked on TV. I didn't know this until people said, we saw you on TV. I, here we go again. OK. So I'm back there behind that guy with the camera. And I, I, I'm the one that never stands. I'm always down low at level. I find that effective because this is what I'm looking for. Nobody knows I'm there. But yet I'm shooting with a, with a wide angle lens, fixed aperture, and I'm just, it's, it, it, the story is presenting itself to me. So at the end, Alan comes in. There I am back there, and that was my shot. And there I am back there on the left, and that was the, uh, and then I'm down there in the middle um, photographing this. Then there was something I decided back in 2005, I said to Alan, I said, we're at the Cape for the launch. I'm gonna make a portrait of you right after the launch. And he's beaming because now it's two hours later, it's success, and I said, you're gonna hold this picture with the latest photograph of what Pluto's system looks like by the Hubble Space Telescope. So Alan was thrilled. I mean, this was a, a truly for him an American enterprise. America did this. Only America is actually, I mean, wave the flag here. Every planet has been an American enterprise. But I knew nine and a half years later, there'd be another shot to make. So that was done pretty simply. This is Alan actually signing uh, a few days afterwards. I used, uh, again, the LED light, the Cineo. This is with a Shamira uh, tent. And I used an egg crate to soften the light to get that particular shot. So one light. And I had a, a sun bounce reflector. That's pretty much the way it works. And there's, of course, the picture of Pluto. Um, so it's quite remarkable when you think that we've gone from there, from Earth, to find evidence of spaceflight. Now, actually, this week, Alan's book just came, came out. It's actually being launched. There's going to be an event at the Intrepid on Friday. And he and David are telling the story of what it was like essentially chasing New Horizons and that journey that began back for Alan when he got out of graduate school in 1989 to pursue getting the funding and how to play the game in Congress and get a spacecraft designed and built and launched and successfully reconnaissance the farthest most planet in our solar system. So the book is out. Um, there are a few of my pictures in I It's bragging rights, but a few. Yeah, because it's not a picture book, it's, it's a storybook. My next mission, and we're wrapping up here, was um, NASA is going to be launching in, in uh, several months a probe to the sun. What makes this interesting to me was that um, the vehicle or the probe is going to orbit within four million miles over the sun. That has never been done. And the enabling technology that made that possible was the uh, design and building of a, of a carbon carbon uh, platform, about four inches thick. They would protect the spacecraft from the essentially two and a half thousand degree temperature of the sun, right? So after many months of, uh, of patience, I was able to, uh, again, have permission to come in there and photograph that particular shield that was and tell a story of Parker Solar Probe. So there's the Cineo on the left, and you see the uh, 5DS Mark II. Um, and true to form, uh, two lenses in my light meter. So it's pretty consistent. Um, that's the way it looks looking down on it. We're in the clean room. All this gets cleaned down with alcohol swabs before uh, we go and put the, the bunny suit on. Um, 
to side light, I use the Cineo lighting to, um, this is a carbon based <laughs> screw made of pure carbon to withstand the temperature of the sun. And I just wanted to be able to show that. I mean, how beautiful it was, but it was, I mean, a basic tool. It was, it was a tool. Here was uh, some instruments from, that were being uh, displayed. These are engineered and milled uh, at APL. And so there's the, um, what they call the thermal protection system, the TPS. And about four inches thick. And um, so I had one light source to, to, um, to make definition. But the real goal was to photograph the, um, the shield as a piece of sculpture. So with my trusty Cineo, I, one light source, that was it. Uh, and one, because uh, I don't want to overload anybody coming in and saying, oh, do you have any plugs do you have? How many of this? You have to keep it simple. So I went from this, and then um, that's me, and I'm working essentially with a wide angle lens, and I'm standing on a, on a step tool, and the result was actually that. And I like the idea that the light overexposed because it makes me feel like, like the sun. And, um, oh God, I just forgot, Elizabeth. Uh, was the lead engineer on that shield, and um, sort of like my portrait of her, um, again, on the light. In another area, this is the probe on the right, and I'm photographing Annette, and Annette um, was the lead engineer in charge of the entire uh, integration and testing of the spacecraft, which has been going on right now. I had one light, as you can see, and uh, kept it very simple, but that was my result. I was able to isolate the spacecraft, not have a lot of people around, and uh, tell the story. I was also able to do this to give a sense of scale to the spacecraft, and also be able to photograph it as kind of like a, a complex abstract art. So one of the things that um, I've learned, and particularly with, with Hubble and all these missions, is um, that the light we see, as I mentioned, travels from yesterday. And in this case, this particular light source is, the, uh, is Omega Centauri. It's a, a star cluster. And it um, takes 15,000 years. The light we're seeing is from 15,000 years ago. It's about the time that Paleolithic man was stenciling the, our ancestors' hands on cave walls in Europe. So the sense of identity became something I began working on, and I continue to work on now. For example, this is the, literally the shadowed self-portrait of the Mars rover um, Opportunity. Uh, yeah, um, it's been updated now for th four years. And thinking that as an extension of man, as a tool. And thinking that um, even here, here's a, a, a stone art showing uh, travel in a boat. And now we, you know, we're traveling in space on robotic arms. This is a I'll show you what's going. So I, I became very interested in looking at more evidence of man that might have something to connect to our earlier history. And this uh, was a piece of okra that early man. This goes back about seventy thousand years ago. This is the first evidence of using some kind of crossing system for calculation or some symbolism, but very, very clear symbolism. And what that reminded me of was this. You can say, what is that? This is actually a, the wall, one of the walls underneath the launch pad at uh, the Kennedy Space Center. And this, this is the launch pad. People rarely see what it looks like underneath, but this launch pad supported back in the 60s all the Apollo launches to the moon and all the space shuttle missions. And I was fascinated whenever I would go visit, there would be the symbolism on the wall. Well, I knew it wasn't cave art, but it reminded me of cave art. This was the engineers in, uh, drawing symbols to indicate weak areas that need to be re needed to be repaired. But I continued to explore that um, on film. I shot color negative film, and I shot, um, and what you're seeing here is what's left of all the, essentially the burn marks from the Apollo era. They've been burned off in the 30 years of shuttle. So this, this stuff goes back to the 60s, early 70s. And then I just start playing with this. Uh, you can see the symbol over there. And I felt I wanted to document this 
because it really was evidence. It really was evidence of um, of space flight, because this was the mark of the tool, and a rocket ship rockets are tools that humans use to leave the planet to go to another, to go out to space. So then I started juxtaposing and thinking, well, these these remind me of, of surfaces. So then I realized, well, yeah, the lunar surface. And if you look at this very sublime picture, right in the middle is the LUN. This is from Apollo um, 15, 16, I believe. And that's the LUN amongst all the lunar hills. And so I started working with, these are um, the burn marks from the shuttle's main engine, all the pluses. These symbols are very similar. Early, early humans worked with pluses, zeros, ellipses, squares, rectangles. And these were the same kind of symbolisms that were being used by the engineers uh, on the launch pads. So I integrated those. And um, various magazines have um, started publishing this work. This is a new scientist published out of London. And then the Smithsonian Magazine um, published this. Um, it was nice, launched into memory. And wrapping up, um, printing the work has been very important for me. That's why I have some prints here. And going back and reiterating from, again, the whole workflow from um, camera to file to the kinds of paper and presentation. Presentation is, is very important, um, as is craft. So I was at um, PhotoFest in Houston back uh, about a month ago showing work. And um, the image that uh, Enrico's looking at is right here on the table. You get a sense of that. This was printed on, on, a, on a Canon printer with uh, Moab paper. So that's sort of it, my evidence of space exploration on Earth. Because I think to get to there, you know, it really has to start here. So that's the evidence. This is, you're seeing, it's really evidence of, of the space shuttle and the Saturn rockets and what they've left behind so that humans can achieve this as we did with Hubble and Neil Armstrong did uh, for Apollo. Now, the only caveat that's kind of a downer is that this flame trench doesn't exist anymore because it was destroyed or torn down uh, in late 2014 because NASA didn't need the area anymore. And so they leased it to SpaceX, which was good. They're doing remarkable things with their, with their engineering and rocketry. And so they readapted this flame trench to suit their, um, their engineering needs for launch. So I've got the only evidence now of what was there. So from self-portrait of an astronaut, ubiquitous, uh, reflecting off the Hubble Space Telescope with a spaceship that got him there and the tool that will go on and explore the mysteries of the universe, and to Neil Armstrong, who we celebrate next year in the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11. Thank you for bearing with us.